Luckily, it's very easy for Americans to remember Charles Darwin's dates because he had the good fortune, at least in terms of our memories, to be born on the very same day as Abraham Lincoln, February 12th, 1809. I mean the very same day, not just the same date. He was 50 years old when he published The Origin of Species in 1959, and that nice coincidence of the 50th birthday celebration and the publication of the great book pretty much sets up the tempo of Darwinian celebrations. So 1909 was the centenary of his birth and the 50th anniversary of the origin. And 1959, which was a time of great Darwin celebrations, was the 100th anniversary of the origin of species. And as you are separating, I think they're called sesquicentennials, the 150th anniversary of his birth. They used to collect stamps. That's how you learn what the 50, 150, 200, et cetera, are called. Now, there were some wonderful parties in 1959. That was a great time of celebration. They were held all over the world. The biggest one in the United States was held in Chicago. And I think the only rain that fell on that particular parade in 1959 was a wonderful address delivered by the great American geneticist H.J. Muller and entitled 100 Years Without Darwin Are Enough. That's an interesting speech if you read it because he's not talking about what you might think. That is, one can talk a lot about the lack of acceptance of evolution itself in American popular culture, the issue of creationism. And Muller mentioned that, but that wasn't the main thing he was talking about. What he wanted to talk about was the lack of understanding of what Darwin's theory actually entailed, not only among people who are perfectly comfortable with the notion that evolution had obviously and factually occurred, but even among people who call themselves Darwinians. And that puzzled him that a theory so widely accepted and honored should be so badly understood, and he wanted to know why. Now look, evolution has become generally known. Let me make the same distinction Darwin made all the time in his writing. Darwin very keenly pointed out again and again that he had tried to do two quite distinctly separate things in his writings about this subject. First was simply to convince the world that evolution had occurred. That is the documentation of the fact of evolution. And in that he was abundantly successful. Darwin lies in Westminster Abbey for his success in having demonstrated to the thinking world that evolution had occurred. We'll come back to that at the very end. Secondly, Darwin said he was also trying to propose a mechanism for how evolution worked. And he came up with a theory, the theory of natural selection. And these are quite different things. That is, one can be fully satisfied that evolution occurred and not like natural selection as a mechanism or not understand natural selection as a mechanism. So I want to point out that I'm talking about this second part today. Charles Darwin's revolution and thought, look, it's revolutionary enough just to find out that evolution happened. But I want to focus on the other part, that is the revolutionary implications of Darwin's own theory for how evolution works, namely the theory of natural selection. And I, I'll tell you where I'm going. I basically want to propose the reason why it hasn't been well understood is not that it's particularly difficult, but really that it's philosophically so radical that even though in a sense it's easy to understand, we don't want to. So we've managed to avoid it. Now, when faced with Muller's dilemma, namely, here's a theory that's well accepted by the scientific community, it's 100 years old, why don't people grasp it? or understand it very well, the first thing you might think is a hypothesis, and it would be perfectly reasonable. Maybe natural selection is very difficult. Uh, that would be my first pass guess if faced with that problem. Is that theory has been around for 100 years. It's accepted by virtually all professionals, yet it's not widely represented correctly. Why don't people? Maybe it's very hard. That can't be true. The theory of natural selection is easy. So it can, the obvious explanation, namely maybe it's very hard and that's why people don't get it, can't be right. 
The theory of natural selection is really pretty simple, at least in terms of its bare bones mechanics. Uh, I, I don't want to give a lecture about the content of natural selection, but while I'm on the topic, let me just express to you how simple it is. I can run it by you in a couple minutes. That can't be the reason why it's poorly understood. Basically, and it's just the bare bones mechanics, the implications are rich and varied and difficult, but as the bare bones mechanics of the theory, it's simplicity itself. Three facts that no one can deny in a simple, almost syllogistic inference. And this is how it's usually presented pedagogically, and that's right. First fact, that all organisms produce more offspring than can possibly survive. That's clearly true, and Darwin goes to great lengths to show that. Fact number two, all organisms vary within a species. Just look around the room, that's folk wisdom, it's obvious. Fact number three, because you need it for a genealogically based theory, that at least some of that variation is inherited. And that's also folk wisdom. Sure, Darwin didn't know the mechanism, the world didn't until the Mendelian rediscovery of 1900, but you don't need to know the mechanism. You just need to know that there is a principle of inheritance, and that's folk wisdom. We know that tall parents tend to have tall kids, short parents, short kids, black parents, black children, white parents, white children. We know it is a principle of inheritance, even if we don't know how it works. Take those three facts, overproduction, variation, and inheritance of some of that variation, and natural selection follows as an almost syllogistic inference. If all organisms produce more offspring than possibly survive, on average, as a statistical phenomenon, not every time, on average, those organisms that fortuitously are better adapted to changing local environments will tend to survive better and produce more offspring, and the average of the population will shift in their direction. To cite a somewhat caricatured example, but it's not grossly off, you have a population of elephants in Russia. The ice is advancing. There's variation in the amount of hair on elephants. Elephants that are a little more hairy on average will do better. The hairiest one might still fall down a crevasse and die, but as a statistical statement, on average, they'll do better in surviving and reproduction. And 100 generations down the line, you'll have a woolly mammoth. That's what natural selection is. It's a principle of adaptation to changing local environments. It's not hard. So why then do we have this odd phenomenon that 100 years, and it's just as true today as when Muller said in 1959, that now close to 200 years after the promulgation of the theory of natural selection, it's still so poorly understood. And I would propose to you, it is the basis of this talk, that the reason must be, in a, in a sentence, that it is philosophically so radical. It stands against so many of the traditional social hopes and psychological biases of our culture that we really just don't want to face them and therefore have tried to put a different kind of spin on natural selection that we can read it more in the light of those biases, which makes it something other than what Darwin intended, something that almost distorts it into its opposite. The way in which I will structure this talk, as it's worked for me in the past, will be a, first a statement or a paradox and then three riddles which I'll attempt to resolve. There are three riddles about Darwin's life and in the resolution of each of the riddles we can understand one of the radical features of Darwin's theory. The first paradox I want to discuss is how can I call Darwin a, a revolutionary thinker if in an old tradition of his biography he wasn't a very smart guy at all. I want to dispense with that quickly. And then I'll take up these three riddles in sequence. My first one is going to be who was the naturalist on board HMS Beagle. And the answer obviously is not Darwin or I wouldn't be posing it. I don't uh, think I'm getting more radical than uh, I wish to be. I'm not going to tell you Darwin wasn't on the ship for five years. He was, but he wasn't the official naturalist. And in there lies a fascinating story which reflects and illustrates one of the radical features of the theory. Secondly, why did Darwin not use the word evolution? That's what we call a process today, but he never describes it as such, and there's an interesting reason for that. Thirdly, why, having developed the theory of natural selection in 1838, being fully aware of its very large implications and being certainly ambitious enough to want credit for it, why did Darwin wait 21 years in order to publish it? Why this delay? It's an old question in Darwinian historiography. And I think in the resolution, or the best resolution, of those three riddles, we can illustrate best 
the three most radical characteristics, philosophically radical characteristics, of the theory of natural selection. Before I do that, though, I do want to dismiss an old Darwin legend that some of you may hear, because it won't, it won't do me any good to argue that Darwin was a philosophical radical if he was philosophically inept or unthinking. And there is an old tradition in the historiography of the biographizing of Darwin, if that's a word, which makes him out to be different from the other geniuses in the history of science. Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, they're all geniuses, whatever that means. Einstein was just supposed to, pardon me, Darwin was just supposed to be a bumbling naturalist, not particularly smart, patiently, doggedly patient to be sure, who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And if that characterization is correct, it's no good talking about his philosophical radicalism if he had no philosophical astuteness. Okay, the three riddles of Darwin's life. First riddle, who was naturalist on board HMS Beagle? Obviously, it wasn't Darwin, it wouldn't be a riddle. He was there, he was there. But he did not come on board as the official ship's naturalist. And therein lies a very interesting story that was only uh, pieced together about 20 years ago by various historians. The official ship's naturalist of the Beagle was a man named McCormick, who was the physician and, and surgeon on the ship. And that was entirely conventional on naval cruises at the time. The surgeon would also serve as the naturalist. So if Darwin was not the official naturalist, what was he doing on board? And to understand that, we have to probe the most interesting, troublesome, and mercurial personality of the captain of the Beagle, Robert Fitzroy, who was certainly a most fascinating man. He was a wealthy man, an aristocratic man by naval convention. He was allowed to take at his own expense as supernumerary passengers any other people he could fit on the Beagle, and other people with similar ambitions have done the same thing. The Admiralty would not fund enough scientists from, Darwin, from Fitzroy's point of view. So he decided he would take along extra passengers at his own expense. He took a cart an, uh, uh, an artist, he took a couple other people with scientific skills, but that's not why Darwin went. Darwin was not at that time in any sense a trained scientist. He was a passionate amateur naturalist, but indeed he was not a trained naturalist, so he couldn't have been brought on board merely as the best person. I can say best man, we didn't let women on ships, and that's not sexist. What sexist was not allowing women on the ships, that's another issue. Uh, he certainly was not the best man available for, uh, for a supplementary naturalist on board the Beagle. So what was he doing there? And that comes to the second and rather more interesting and complex reasons for Fitzroy's decision. You have to understand something about the naval practice at the time, which in our psychologically more enlightened century seems so problematical. That is, the psychological toll on long voyages was immense, particularly on aristocratic captains, who by social convention could have no contact except to give ship's orders with anyone on board. Fitzroy would dine alone. No one was close to his social rank. No one was fit to eat with him. Unless he brought someone else, he would be alone all the time at sea, and sometimes periods at sea would run for months and months. If he encountered another ship at sea, he could dine with the captain. When he was in port, he could dine with the local aristocracy. But while on the ship, he was absolutely alone. And the psychological toll was great, and that was well understood. In fact, the previous captain of the Beagle had killed himself at sea under similar circumstances. This is a well-recognized issue, and many captains did bring along supernumerary passengers more or less as social companions to combat this extreme danger of the effects of loneliness. And Fitzroy had more particular reasons, and I think quite accurate ones, for being worried. He greatly feared, and I think he was entirely correct, what he perceived as a strain of serious mental illness in his family, which undoubtedly would be so recognized today as, as bipolar manic depression. His uncle, Viscount Castlereagh, whom he resembled so strongly, his maternal uncle, a very enigmatic and interesting man whose exploits go so far as suppressing the Irish Peasant Revolt in 1798, for which many of us might not approve of him, to essentially allowing the United States to get off easy in the War of 1812, which just between you and me, we lost. It was Castlereagh who allowed us to have a face-saving treaty at Ghent, whereby we could keep all our territories. Uh, one of Britain's great statesmen, diplomats, he had committed suicide by slitting his throat 
during one of his periods of manic depression just a few years before. Fitzroy felt that he was very much like Castlereagh, subject to similar fits of depression. So that is right, Darwin went as Fitzroy's social companion. He was certainly well qualified by the proper criterion of social class. Darwin's father was a very wealthy and respected physician. His grandfather had been Erasmus Darwin, one of the great intellects and writers and physicians of the Birmingham circle. He certainly qualified. The fact that he knew natural history certainly didn't hurt. I mean, Fitzroy was going to take a social companion anyway. Why not get someone also competent in natural history at the same time since he was trying to beef up the Beagle Scientific Medal? All right, interesting story, but why does it have any relevance to this issue? So Darwin sailed as Fitzroy's social companion. That meant he ate every meal with Fitzroy alone. He was Fitzroy's only social contact for five years. Now understand what kind of man Fitzroy was. He was enormously mercurial, subject to fits of rage, always possibly going over that edge into a bout of depression, which everyone wished so fervently to prevent. It took someone of Darwin's enormous geniality and understanding. There's no sign the two seem to get along reasonably well. Now what would Darwin, I, I can't help thinking it's the fly in the wall uh, fantasy. What were they talking about? You know, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall when Franklin and uh, Jefferson discussed liberty or when Lenin and Trotsky discussed revolution? I certainly would have liked to have been a fly on the wall when Darwin and Fitzroy had their, their dinner. So we don't know what they talked about. And what I'm going to tell you now is conjectural, but I think very plausible. Now, what are they talking about? Maybe they agreed about everything, then it wouldn't be a big issue. But they didn't. Fitzroy had two idées fixes, two central notions to his worldview that could not have been more opposite to Darwin's belief. And they were the two great issues that uh, divide people to this day, that is politics and religion. <laughs> In politics, Fitzroy was an ardent Tory, a conservative. Darwin, an equally committed Whig, a liberal in his terms. 19th century terms. They virtually came to blow on the most contentious issue of all, slavery. Fitzroy was a great supporter of the benevolence of slavery. Darwin, in fact, was almost a professional abolitionist. He married into the Wedgwood family, who had been leaders of the British abolitionist movement. Nothing was a stronger belief in his own worldviews. You cannot find more moving passages against the slave trade. Now, the other place where they differed, or at least came to differ later, was religion. We don't know much about Darwin's religious views at that time, but we do know about Fitzroy's. He really had an idée fixe on the subject of religion. He was a very firm supporter of that most distinctively English brand of argument about the consonance of theology and natural history, namely the so-called argument from design as embodied in William Paley's book. Natural theology is a particularly English form of argument that goes back to Boyle in the 17th century and up through Paley in 1802 and pretty much ends with Darwin and Darwin's generation. But the particular argument of natural theology, to review it for you, is that not only God's existence but also his benevolence, his omniscience, and his intelligence can be illustrated from the nature of the works of the creation, in particular from two aspects of natural history, namely the good design of organisms and the harmony of ecosystems. The good design of organisms and the harmony of ecosystems must mean that a benevolent God, a benevolent all-knowing and omniscient God, created them. You, know, you read Paley's famous metaphor of the watch. If I'm walking across a heath and I kick my foot against a stone and I look at it, I won't know who made the stone because it's disordered and I can't make an inference about the nature of the maker or the origin of this thing. But if I kick my foot against a watch and I pick it up and look at it and understand how it works, I know there has to be a watchmaker. Organisms are better designed than watches, so there has to be a benevolent creating God. That's the so-called argument from design. Now, here's the point of this long story. I hope you'll pardon me for spitting it out because it is, it is the most central radicalism of Darwin. The most radical feature of the theory of natural selection is the way in which, as its central postulate, it undermines in the most radical possible way the argument from design. That's, in a sense, what it's constructed to do. Now, I don't know 
that Darwin did this explicitly on purpose to confute Fitzroy. But I have this view. It's the fly on the wall fantasy again. There's Darwin. He's beginning to doubt religious views, beginning to get some ideas about evolution, eating with Fitzroy every day, frustrated as hell about slavery and other issues and things he can't confute him on, and every day Fitzroy is at him. Darwin, did you see that lizard? Did you see how beautifully adapted it was? Doesn't that prove the existence of an all-knowing God who made it just that way because it's so beautifully adapted? Day after day for five years, the argument from design, the argument from design, unable to confute, undoubtedly get. Wouldn't that drive you to, to think about constructing an opposite theory? Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you were Darwin, if you were someone of that brilliance, you know, there's a famous story about Fitzroy True, that he appeared in his demented state late in life at the famous Oxford meeting where Huxley debated Wilberforce, or didn't. That story is also often mistold. Uh, carrying a Bible above his head, saying, the book, the book, and cursing himself for having been an unwitting agent of Darwin's apostasy. Now, I think that all that Fitzroy was thinking is that he'd been an unwitting agent in the sense he brought Darwin to all these places where he got these terrible ideas. But you see, I think Fitzroy was right in a deeper way that he never understood. I think he was the unwitting agent in a much more direct way by hammering Darwin day after day with argument from design, argument from design. That's the fundamental observation of natural history that is the most central postulate about the nature of the natural world out there. Because let's look at it in the abstract. When I, when I tell you, suppose, let's just suppose I'm right, that Darwin in some psychologically explicit or implicit sense is trying to refute the argument from design. How do you go about it? Well, I can imagine two ways. One thing you might do, and it would be pretty radical, but it's not what Darwin did, and it's not the most radical argument. It'd be pretty radical. You could say, hey, there's a lot of good design in nature, but you know there's a lot of very bad design in nature also. Some things are badly designed. Some things are horribly cruel by human standards, like the ichneumonid wasp that paralyzes the caterpillar, lays the eggs inside the living tissue of the caterpillar. When they hatch, they eat the caterpillar from inside, still alive though paralyzed, saving the heart and nervous system for last so the caterpillar doesn't rot. Not very nice by human standards. <laughs> you, might, you might infer from that that if you wish to say that God's nature and attributes and existence can all be inferred from the argument from design, then maybe if nature is so cruel and so messy, maybe that's not the kind of God you want. Maybe you ought to be making that argument. And that would be a pretty radical argument, but that's not the one Darwin made. In fact, Darwin accepted the postulate. He said, yes, there's some cruelty and some messiness, but for the most part, organisms are well-designed and ecosystems are harmonious. And now we come to the more radical argument, the one that Darwin did take as the central postulate of the theory of natural selection. And that is, you say, oh, Paley, you're absolutely right. Your observations are correct. Organisms are well designed and ecosystems are harmonious. But guess what? That doesn't illustrate the existence and benevolence of an explicitly creating deity. In fact, just the opposite. Although those are true observations, they arise instead as side consequences. There is no principle explicitly producing them at all. They arise as side consequences, in fact, and here's the ultimate, almost cruel irony with respect to Paley. They arise as side consequences of the only thing that's really happening in nature, a thing which, if you wished to imbue it with moral meaning, which you should not, that's the point I'll get back to at the end, would seem to make a mockery of the whole argument for design. Maybe the only thing that's really happening in nature is that organisms are striving for personal reproductive success. That's all. They are out for themselves. All, I mean, they're not doing it in any conscious sense, but that's all natural selection is about. The organisms that are more successful in reproduction pass in modern parlance more of their genes into future generations. That's all there is. There is no principle of the good of the species. There's no principle of excellence of design explicitly so made. There's no principle of the harmony of ecosystems. These all arise as side consequences of the only thing that's really happening out there in nature, which is of opposite import 
to what we thought Thales' God was teaching us. Now, the only thing that's really happening out there is organisms are struggling for individual reproductive success for themselves, and that is absolutely all. Now, that's really a radical argument. That is Darwin's argument, and that's something we haven't wanted to make peace with, that the natural section is so rigidly naturalistic, so purposeless. It's only about organisms struggling for themselves, for personal reproductive success. It leads only to local adaptation, not to any form of predictable progress, and that's all there is to it. Um, yes, where did, where did Darwin get this? Where does it come from? And to some of you, I'm sure you'll realize that it sounds very much like uh, another theory you know about, and this is an interesting point, that is where Darwin's got it. It's very close to Adam Smith's economics, and we now know that in 1838, when Darwin developed the principle of natural selection, that's what he was doing for the few weeks before he got this great insight after reading Malthus. That is, he was studying the work of the Scottish economist through the work of Douglas Stewart on the life of Adam Smith. That is Adam Smith's argument transferred to nature. That's the beauty of it. I mean, think about it. You, we want a well-ordered economy. Now, you might think that the best way to get a well-ordered economy that will turn the greatest good to the greatest number is to get all the smart folks who know a lot about economics, give them power, sit them around a table and let them figure out how to do it and then pass laws explicitly for that arrangement. Now that's the equivalent of Paley's God. If you want good organization and harmony, just let an all-knowing God make it explicitly. You know, let the economists who know it best just make the laws. But Adam Smith's argument is wonderfully paradoxical. He says, no, that may seem right, but in fact, you want to do something that looks like the opposite. What you want to do is let individuals struggle for personal profit, and you don't trammel them in any way. That's laissez-faire. You just let them be. You let them struggle for personal profit, and that's all. There is no higher principle. If you do that without any trammels, then the ones who do it well will drive out the others. The ones who do it well will balance each other, and you end up indirectly with the well-functioning economy by letting people struggle for personal profit. And then Smith introduced that wonderful metaphor, one of the great lines in the English language, that you get that order and harmony, he says, through the action of an invisible hand. That there is no directing hand of Haley's God. It's the invisible hand. The only thing that's happening is you're letting individuals struggle for personal profit, and out of that indirectly comes the maximally ordered economy. Darwin's argument is the same transferred to nature. Truly, you can't take it with you, so personal profit is not the natural analog, but reproductive success is. So in nature, all you have are organisms struggling for individual reproductive success. That is for their own benefits and passing more of their genetic material onto future generations. And that is all. That is all Darwinism's about. And it seems cruel, and it seems heartless, and it seems counter to our hopes, and we haven't liked it. And uh, there endeth the first riddle. For the second, why does Darwin not use the word evolution? The main reason is that the word evolution, though not a common one in the English language at the time, had a definite meaning, primarily in poetry and metaphor, and it meant progress. Evolutio means unfolding. Literally, evolution is an unfolding of a kind of preordained or prearranged sequence. And Darwin's theory is non-progressivist. That's what's unique about it. That's why he doesn't use the word. That in a, in a line is the resolution of the second riddle. If there's one thing we desperately want evolution to be, it's a principle that predicts progress or that sees progressive complexification as a property of evolution through time because it's only that way that we can justify our eventual appearance and our hegemony over this earth as somehow implicit in the workings of evolutionary theory. We don't want to believe the converse, which I think is true, that we're just an accidental little late arising twig on this enormously arborescent bush of life, which if you could replant it from seed would probably never yield anything like us again. That I think is correct. But we don't want to see that. We wish to view evolution as inherently and predictably progressive so that the origin of something like us, though we occupy but a millimicrosecond of cosmic time, is reasonable and predictable. That's what we want. So Darwin doesn't use the word evolution because it meant progress. And his theory, almost uniquely among 19th century evolutionary theories, was non-progressivist. As I said before, Darwin's theory is about local adaptation. 
It is about adaptation to changing local environments. The hairy elephant in Russia is a better elephant for that environment. But it's not a better elephant in any cosmic or general sense. And that's all natural selection can do for you. It can adapt you to changing local environments. As environments change on a random vector through time, you're not going to extract from a process that merely adapts to changing local environments any overarching principle of progress. And Darwin was well aware of that. Look, this is a complex subject. I don't have time for it. Darwin was an eminent Victorian, and he managed to smuggle a kind of argument about progress back in under another guise. But he was very clear in his recognition that the bare bones mechanics of the theory of natural selection yields no principle of progress. And in that is perhaps its greatest radicalism with respect to pop culture's perception of what evolution must be and mean. And there's much documentation of this in Darwin. He wrote a little marginal note in one of his books once, never say higher or lower in referring to organisms. He had a correspondence late in his life with a man whose office I now occupy, the Harvard paleontologist at the time, Alpheus Hyatt. Now Hyatt was a convinced progressionist who thought that there was a principle of progress pervading evolution. Darwin wrote to him, finally, its last line, after long reflection, I cannot avoid the conclusion that no inherent tendency to progressive development exists. I can't get any clearer than that. So why do we call the process evolution? And that's an interesting story, too. Uh, the main answer is Herbert Spencer, the great Victorian polymath of nearly everything. Herbert Spencer, whose writings were so influential in Darwin's age, did have an explicitly progressivist theory, not only of biological change, but of every kind of change, whether it was cosmological, economic, artistic, human cultural, they were all inherently progressive, and therefore he called them evolution because he knew what the word meant. Now, since most 19th century thinkers wouldn't accept Darwin's radicalism any more than we would today, they were very comfortable with Spencer's notion that you ought to use a word that means inherent progress because that's how they wanted to see evolution as a process that predicted an inherent form of progress. Eventually, Darwin gave up late in his life. I think in his last book on worms, he finally uses the word evolution in Spencer's sense as everybody else was. But he initially didn't want to because his theory was non-progressive. And therein lies his other, in many ways, in terms of pop culture, misconceptions, his greatest radicalism. Well, now look at my second set of slides which some of you have heard me talk before, have seen at least some of these before. These are a series of slides primarily from advertising and pop culture, illustrating our misidentification of evolution, our misequation, I should say, of evolution with a notion of inherent progress. It doesn't mean that. And yet the only icon we know, the only picture we know of evolution is the ladder of ascent from ape to human or from single-celled creature up. Look, I'm not saying that this is literally what we believe. This is a caricature. That's why it's funny. That's why cartoonists and advertisers use it. But it's only a caricature of what we really do believe, that there is a more general predictable form. We wouldn't understand it as the primary icon of evolution if it weren't, in fact, a caricature of our actual beliefs, namely that there is, at least in a broad sense, a predict progressivist predictability to increasing complexification and evolution. These come primarily from cartooning and advertising. My friend Mike Peters, who does Mother Goose and Grimm and who started at the Dayton Daily News as their editorial cartoonist, once put it to me very well in saying, if you want to really understand what pop culture takes as its primary picture of any phenomenon, you look to our work. Because as you're going through your newspaper, you're going to give one-tenth of a second's attention to any drawing that you see. And unless it is the canonical drawing, the one that everybody understands, you'll pass it by. And that's why we have to use the drawing that people understand. So here is evolution in popular culture. And I know no more dramatic example of our continuing confusion of evolution with progress and, our theref and therefore, as Muller put it, our inability really to grasp the essence of Darwin's argument. Oh, the, I, I, there are several sub-series here. This is the American Regionalism sub-series. California version, the evolution of surf trunks through history. As anyone who's sensitive to regional accents will know, I'm a New Yorker. And the next one is my version. This is the anywhere in America where scientific creationism is rampant version. 
Here's a gentleman holding a sign saying Earth is only 10,000 years old, standing in his proper place in the sequence. Next is the American Cultures series. First we have High Culture. The ones I've selected, I have an enormous collection of these things. I've selected for tonight a sub-series that just shows the ape to human part of the series. But I thought I'd show you one that shows the whole thing from amoebae up here to white male in a business suit down there, thereby folding another kind of bias into the diagram. I don't want you to think I'm some elitist only making fun of pop culture. This kind of icon does not appear in professional publications as often, but sometimes it does. This is from the best available textbook on human evolution, Campbell's Humankind Emerging. And what do we see? The march of evolution from the chimp in the trees, who's not our ancestor but our cousin, up the conventional sequence. Australopithecus shown as stoop-shouldered, even though we've known since the 1920s they walked as erect as we do, up the conventional sequence. And let me mention another other kind of rather more pernicious bias embedded in here, which is unconscious. I'm sure if I pointed this out to the artist, that person would want every copy of this back and deep six them all and start over again. But do notice the progressive lightening of skin in the racist tradition, and that's not because there's less hair, there's actually a lightening of skin. We do this so unconsciously, we don't even see the racist context out of which it came. How many of you noticed the first slide I showed? had the same lightening of skin in the surf trunks. I showed that slide for two years before I noticed it. That's how unconscious we are. And by the way, uh, quite apart from its moral perniciousness, it doesn't even make any sense in any way, no matter what your views on race are, all human races are equally old. It doesn't make any logical sense to depict that current variety with any one race, whatever one you choose. Okay, so that's that. Now, what is Darwinian theory about? As I said, these are my last couple slides, it is about adaptation to changing local environments. That's all it's about, principle of natural selection. Every naturalist has their favorite example. I will give you mine. Uh, where'd it go? <laughs> This looks for all the world like a fish, right? It's got an eye, it's got fins, waves the fins, but it's not a fish. In fact, it is a brood pouch for eggs of a clam, a freshwater mussel, a unionid mussel called Lamcillus. Now, why should a clam evolve a brood pouch that looks like a decoy fish on its rear end? As soon as you understand the breeding cycle of these clams, it becomes clear. These clams uniquely among the clams have larvae which must become parasitic on the gills of a fish if they're going to survive. So a real fish comes down to eat or to investigate. The mother fish shoots the larvae at the act of the body, the mother clam shoots the larvae at the actual fish, and some of them attach to the gills and begin their free ride into the next generation. And that's a wonderfully exquisite, remarkable adaptation. I mean, it just fills you with awe and marvel. But it doesn't make a better clam in any cosmic sense, right? This clam isn't better than a scallop. It's not better than a quahog. It's not better than an oyster. It's just a clam with an exquisite adaptation to its own immediate state. That's what Darwinian theory is about. Fine, that's the second riddle. Third riddle, much shorter than the other two. Darwin's delay. Why did Darwin, you can turn that off because that's it for slides. Why did Darwin, having developed the principle of natural selection in 1838 and being fully aware of what he had and how important it was and being young and ambitious and wanting credit for it, why does he delay until 1859 before publishing? And it's pretty clear it wasn't out of diffidence. I mean, he knew he had it, he was pretty sure he was right. He left his wife strict instructions that should he die before writing The Origin of Species, that alone among his unpublished works, she should publish the preliminary sketches of 1842 and 1844 in which he had developed the theory of natural selection. He wanted it out. So why did he delay? Uh, no, I think one has to say, and I'm not saying anything at all original here, anyone would say, this Darwin was obviously afraid. It must have been fear that was motivating him not to publish. And therefore, one must ask, fear of what? Now, the obvious answer would be, but it's wrong, fear of exposing his belief in evolution, which is supposed to have been the great heresy of 19th century science. If you know anything about the history of evolution, you immediately realize that cannot be true. I used to say in lectures like this that evolution was the most common heresy in the 19th century, but that's not right, it wasn't even a heresy. The most you can say is that evolution was the most common unorthodoxy of early 19th century science. You didn't get in trouble by confessing a belief in evolutionary change. 
I suspect somewhere close to a majority of uh, the great biologists of Europe accepted some form of evolutionary argument. If you go to France in the first decade of the 19th century, of the three great zoologists there, Geoffroy, Lamarck, and Cuvier, it's only Cuvier who's anti-evolution, Geoffroy and Lamarck are both evolutionists. Richard Owen was an evolutionist in his own way. One of Darwin's teachers, Granted, Edinburgh, was a, an evolutionist. No, one did not get in trouble for exposing a belief in evolution particularly a nice, friendly, positively spun belief that evolution means predictably progressive change up the ladder of progress to human beings in some spiritual sense, moreover, as many 19th century evolutionary theories had it. So it cannot have been fear of evolution. But Darwin was afraid. What was he afraid of? And the answer seems to be to something that's been studied quite a lot in the last 20 years. He was afraid, in short, in a way this sums up what I've been saying, of the radical philosophical implications of the principle of natural selection, of his own take on evolution, of his own theory about how evolution occurred, not of evolution itself. Now, when Darwin wrote about this to himself privately in his notebooks, what he said is very interesting, and I think it captures the main point. What he said is that he was afraid to expose his belief in materialism. And by that, I don't mean the usual vernacular sense today of love of BMWs or Armani suits or anything like that. I mean the philosophical position that contrary to the deep tradition of dualism, in which you have material stuff or matter and mental stuff or spirit constituting the universe, dualism, in which the spirit stuff, being of God at least initially, is the higher of the two forms, Instead, materialism claims that there is only matter and that all those things we consider spirit and imbue with divine this or that are really just manifestations of properties of matter arranged in complex ways. And what we call the mind is a product of the material substrate of the neurology of the brain. Now, that's a radical notion in 19th century terms for which one could get in considerable trouble. And I'd just like to read you a couple of Darwin's own statements about it. Here's a, a marvelous one where he, in a sense, uh, is expressing his intellectual joy at his apostasy. He says, love of the deity and effective organization. In other words, is it really true that our love of God is just the result of the way the, the uh, neural substrate of the brain is organized? Oh, you materialist, he's talking to himself. Why is thought being a secretion of brain more wonderful than gravity as a property of matter? It is only our arrogance and our admiration of ourselves. That's a brilliant statement. And here's another one where he's very explicit, tells himself, don't admit your materialism. He says, to avoid stating how far I believe in materialism, say only that emotions, instincts, degrees of talent, which are hereditary, are so because brain of child resembles parent stock. In other words, don't just say that, 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 that Children are often like parents because it's a principle of inheritance. Don't say it's because it's a material substrate that we're inheriting. Just leave it alone. No, that really does run contrary to the greatest Western philosophical tradition of dualism, the separate realm of spirit with spirit higher than mind. And so in short, if you want to summarize the three, it's the naturalism and the purposelessness of the Adam Smith analogy for the first riddle. It's the non-progressionism of the second riddle. It's the materialism and the other forms of philosophical radicalism of the third riddle. And it's interesting because if you look at what's common to non-Darwinian evolutionary theories through most of time since 1859, it's their unwillingness to accept these philosophically radical postulates which deprive the universe of intrinsic, friendly, furry meaning in human terms. There's most other theories, theories like neo-Lamarckism, which state that organisms respond creatively to felt needs and can convey their own desires into changing form. Or the theory of orthogenesis, which says that there's inherent, progressive, predictive tendencies in evolution, or the theory of vitalism, which says that life has that special something distinct from non-life which drives it forward. I mean, all of these, in a sense, have in common their desire to, uh, to escape from Darwin's implications. But I would like to, to end this, and I have a few minutes of a tape I want to play as an actual end, by asking why we do react so negatively to these messages of Darwin's actually th actual theory. I will admit that those messages give us a cold bath. 
with respect to certain hopes that nature might be warm and furry, but why should nature be warm and furry with respect to our hopes? After all, nature existed for four and a half billion years before we got here. They didn't know we, nature didn't know we were coming and frankly doesn't give a damn about us and why should she? Uh, I mean, it's an odd notion that this world, having been here for so long, should have a moral, an implied moral construction that matches our sense of how we ought to be living our lives. Why should it? And therefore, you might as well take the cold bath, which will get us away from that false argument. It's not only a false argument, it's a passive and dangerous argument, because it tells us we shouldn't engage in moral struggle to figure out the meaning of our lives from the humanistic tradition as we should, but that somehow passively we should learn to read nature, and when we read nature right, we'll figure it all out, we'll know how we ought to live. It doesn't work that way. And yet there is no doubt that there's a deep tradition of humanism which has been profoundly unhappy with or suspicious of Darwin and Darwinism. And I don't really understand why that should be so. I'll just read you one poem. This is Thomas Hardy, one of his many anti-Darwin poems. This is Nature's Questioning, where the objects of nature are despairing at Darwin's new world. Hardy says, when I look forth at dawning, pool, field, flock, and lonely tree, all seem to gaze at me like chastened children, sitting silent in a school. And on them stirs in lippings mere, as if once clear in call, but now scarce breathed at all. We wonder, ever wonder, why we find us here. And in Darwinism, there really is no answer to why this worm is here rather than that one that didn't make it, and that's fine. And yet we are not willing, apparently, to accept that we, particularly as human beings, are here for no cosmic reason, that we have no special status, but to me, that's immensely liberating. It's not the job of science to define the meaning of life. We can't do that. That's not what the enterprise of science is about. That is the task of religion and philosophy and the, hum and the humanistic enterprises. Therefore, the humanists should welcome that cold bath, which highlights their own task. I don't understand it. Is the B minor mass any less beautiful if we decide that uh, Bach's genius resides in some ineffable arrangement of the neurons of his brain? Is the beauty of nature any less so because it's unplanned? No, I don't really understand it. I'd like to end with a comment on science and religion relative and relevant to this uh, issue of how we should be viewing nature. There is a notion of wisdom in the Old Testament. I think the Old Testament means something quite different from it, as uh, I will take it, but I think it's a legitimate reading for our lives today, and that is that if it is wisdom that we seek, and it should be, what, what is wisdom? It's a combination of knowledge, which is what science can supply, and moral understanding, which science cannot supply. Science can supply factual material that will help us in our struggle to reach moral decisions, but uh, moral truth is not what science can go after. I want to tell you a story about Darwin's death. Darwin died in 1881, and he wished to be buried in the uh, churchyard of his little town in Down, where he had spent most of his adult life. But the opinion and politicking of his influential scientific friends prevailed, and a spot was secured for him in Westminster Abbey, where he lies literally at the feet of Isaac Newton. You can visit him there if you're ever in London. And when he died, and for his burial, a funeral anthem was written by the organist of Westminster Abbey, a man named Bridge. I had known about this for a long time, but I had never heard it. I didn't even know that the music existed. And a few years ago, a colleague of mine unearthed the score of this funeral anthem that was written for Darwin's death. And I'm a choral singer, among my other sins, so I actually persuaded my choral conductor to record this. I want to play you this funeral anthem, and the reason I want to do that is it's just to me so wonderfully symbolic. Darwin, the great atheistic, or at least materialistic man of science, buried in the seat of the Anglican Church in Westminster Abbey, the two traditions coming together. Sung by the Boston Cecilia and marred only by the presence of yours truly in the bass section. Thank you. <laughs> 